So thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode where I'm going to talk about trains. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the topic that I think kind of created my public persona, which is uh, construction costs and differences. So, um, so, so I think that to the extent people on the internet have heard of me, it's because of comparisons of construction costs, uh, which well, I believe it's this blog post. Uh, yeah, it is going to be this one. It is a blog post that I wrote in 2011 with only a small handful of projects, some of which have run over since. For example, East Side Axis is no longer 8.4, it's 12. Um, SAS is actually a little less than this, that it's at the low end, I think it's maybe 4.7. Um, Crossrail has run over a little bit. Central Subway has run over by a little bit. Um, the rest are old. So I think the North-South line might have had a slight crossover. But, um, um, but at any rate, um, so this is a small comparison and it's turned something a lot bigger, which is this. Look at this number. So first the lines are not projects, everything else is project. Yeah, we have 617 lines and it's not a complete uh, it's not a complete database unfortunately. We still have lacunae. Um, my guess is that actually the majority of world metros under construction are uh, in operation are listed. Um, so, so, my, so I believe that the thirteen thousand is a majority of world metro uh, of world metros counting under construction and um, in design ones. Um, but I, I don't know how big of a majority it is. The problem is that um, we have so our, so we have certain gaps in places where it's hard to find information in English. Um, so I think Russia is a pretty big gap. Um, China is not. Uh, Okay, um, I think I briefly disconnected and I reconnected, um, and I apologize. Um, oh shit, it's actually still disconnected. So if you're watching this on YouTube, that's going to be fine. Um, you're just going to see me swear from time to time about the connection being unstable. But, um, okay, so, um, so we, so our gaps are places that don't speak English and where we also don't have um, people um, working for us, for example, um, Inan Yao gave us so much data on China. I think I mentioned once uh, that Inan actually contributed more than I did to the database by overall one, because so much construction is happening in China. Um, Turkey, that's Elif's domain. Uh, and much of the rest of the world things are uh, oh, and, and they are, um, the, the Arab uh, systems are from uh, Anan Malouf. Um, but again, we still have, but we still have gaps. Um, Russia is somewhat of a gap. Korea is somewhat of a gap. Um, historic things are somewhat of gaps. Uh, so basically, not, so I'm not going to um, break the database by, um, reor by, by um, hitting the um, sort button on the end year column, but I, th I think that like the majority of the database belongs. It's things that have not yet opened, and something like 90% is things that have either not yet opened or opened since 2010. So very little of this is old. So yeah, we can find things that are kind of old, like the U8 extension from the 90s, but I don't know how much things cost in Berlin in the 60s and 70s, for example, or, um, or in the 
I wouldn't say we're in the twenties, but in the twenties, all of the numbers are going to be fake news because the uh, because U six specifically was built during the period of hyperinflation. So trying to figure out the exact cost of that is going to be really weird. But there are other lines in in Berlin that are built before before the war, not during hyperinflation, and I don't know their costs. And in Paris, I know a little bit. In New York, I know a little bit. In London, I know a little bit. I, I not not at the level of project length cost. Um, so again, we still have gaps. It's not a complete database. We're getting there, but it's not complete. So I'm bringing all of this up. First of all, because I don't want people thinking that this is absolutely the last word. So this is a big contribution, I think, to um, to, to any kind of literature that really looks at this. So things like project management, um, um, issues of absolute cost versus cost overruns, issues of institutional design. I think all of these are... Um, for, for all of these, I think this database is very relevant, but I want to make it clear that this is still a this is still a somewhat under construction database. Um, so now, um, and and there's the high speed rail cost database. This is a much, um, th this is actually a much easier thing. Why is it? Oh, okay. So look at clean because the one that isn't clean includes things that are not high speed. Um. So this is not a complete database either because um, we have gaps in China. So we have the oldest things in China and we have the newer things in China. We don't have the intermediate ones. Um, and remember, a pretty large majority of global high-speed rail ridership is in China. Um, I think also a majority of road length is in China. Um, so again, it's a pretty serious message. That said, something that you can see from both this database and from our initial database is that costs are mostly a feature of the country. Um, so Chinese projects, I mean, they have a range, don't get me wrong, but they cluster around a pretty similar average, which is around 200-ish million per kilometer, 250. So you can kind of see that all of these Chinese projects um, I'm, I'm going to just do a little bit of scroll, and I know that my face is going to... Actually, let me move my face for a second, just because I know that I'm... Just because I know that this is on the right-hand side, on the right-hand side, and the... um and, and the label that was just trying to... I mean, you can just tell that this is in Yan. So you can kind of tell these are these all these, not all. I mean, you do have weird things like line one Western extension in Shanghai. Shanghai tends to be more expensive. It has alluvial soil, um, and uh, this is something that you know explained to me that um, the alluvial soil might make things difficult. And then my immediate gut reaction is to try to disprove it by looking at um, by looking at similar examples, except the similar examples actually confirm this explanation because the Netherlands is kind of the Shanghai of Europe or vice versa. I mean, the area around Shanghai is literally the Netherlands of China, um, both in the commercial orientation and in the fact that it's at the mouth of a river at sea level, very vulnerable to flooding, um, very soft soil. Um, and so in the Netherlands too, the construction costs are some of the highest in Europe, I think the Netherlands actually has the highest construction costs of any Western European country that is not Britain or maybe Ireland when it's around to building something in Dublin. But um, but but the point is that these projects, I mean, okay, so these are things that are a little bit cheaper. The ones that are in they're in Hefe, so very poor city, and um, so so again, all of this comes with a range, but it's not like. There's a lot of 80 and a lot of 700. There's a little bit of 700 and a little bit of 90 or 80, but for the most part, these are things that are 200-ish. So, so or, or high 100. Um, so the fact that the construction costs are a feature of the country is really important because it points to institutional design as something that is very important. And uh, the uh, so again, there's a range. To, I mean, it's not going to be exactly the same all the time, but uh, but it's very suggestive. Spain, likewise. Um, there's kind of the Barcelona cost, which is a little bit higher than the rest of Spain cost. Um, 
And once that exists, um, one starts asking questions about about institutions. So this is not 100% a thing. I mean, engineering factors obviously matter a lot. Uh, and this is where we're starting looking at platform length, um, which we're only starting to key in. And the issue is that, um, for example, the standalone lines, some of them are rather long, but not all of them. Um, so some of them, for example, this one, the platform length, 100 meters is not long platforms. Uh, Berlin is about 100. Uh, New York is about 180, and it's one of those things that it's kind of an attractive explanation for why New York is so expensive. It's also a wrong explanation. 180, you see these? These are the cost. This is how much it costs to build this when you're in Istanbul. And these are underground and these are underground projects. And these are ongoing, it's not the cost of 20 years ago that can't occur. And so um the so platform length it, it, it clearly matters because station construction is obviously so important in the in the share of construction. Uh it's just that somehow so many other things matter that even things like how big the stations are, again, I want to stress once again this matters and um, internally for example it is much easier to build 90 than 180 um so we have this regional rail dummy which is one for regional rail lines and zero otherwise and it pretty strongly correlates with construction costs but and here's an important but um at least to some extent it's because regional rail tunnels tend to be built um for longer trains so um so, so, so look at Munich, for example. So the second trunk line in Munich, it's about 200, maybe even 210 meters of train. So the so these are very long platforms, and that's not how the Munich U-Bahn looks. So let's actually see if there's any Munich U-Bahn on this line, uh, on this. I, yeah, it's here. Yeah, so let's see, Munich. Oh, we only have the S bahn drawn here, not because like, maybe there's no U-Bahn here. Okay, but um, so let's see. Uh, so let's move myself back to my usual spot. I feel a little self-conscious about that. I'm wrong side. Um, so rolling stock. Um, so up to three of these. Uh, can be coupled, and you see it's 3 times 37, so it's about 110. And um, so so the platforms on the U-Bahn in Munich are barely half the size of the S-Bahn platforms. This is also the case in uh, Paris. In uh, Paris, uh, I'm going to add all of these. So Company Express, I think, is actually one of the shorter ones. But their metro extensions, they tend to be five to maybe eight cars, so that's 80 to 100, okay, 90. No, not, not 90. Yeah, it's 80. So it's, a, it's about 15 or 16 meters per car, so it's about 80 to 120 meters. And the RER is 200 to 220, or maybe even 230. Um, so, so bigger trains, this was actually cited as the reason behind the extremely high cost of the original RER. But um, that, it, it's only true up to a limit, and, and, and regional rail also, also tends to be more expensive. It's not just the station size, it's also, there, there's this measure that we don't have because we don't know how to quantify, which is line centrality, which is that it's easier to build line one than to build line 10 when line 10 goes through city center because it has to go underneath lines one through nine. And regional rail tunnels, not always. Um, so for example, the one in uh, Auckland um, is the first tunnel in the city, but usually these are built uh, underneath older projects. This is very true of Crossrail. Crossrail had to cross the entirety of the, uh, the entirety of the legacy tube. So, the, so obviously it would be a more complex project. And likewise, Marmarai, um, Marmarai didn't have to cross underneath this many tunnels, don't get me wrong, um, but Marmarai 
Um, so, so the whole point of regional rail. Um, so, so what is the point of regional rail? Why, for example, am I zero on all of these Chinese projects? All these Chinese projects, even ones that are that go deep into suburbia, because the point of a system where you don't have regional rail, which is basically how China works, all they are kind of sort of slowly trying to rectify that, is that you're going to build a long line, a long metro line connecting various parts of the city um, and also the city's more suburban areas. The point of regional rail is usually you take legacy lines that pre-exist and you connect them or you add capacity to them through city center. So the whole point of regional rail is you build less tunnel, but you build the tunnel in the most difficult parts. So um, let me see if I can find RERE. Yeah. So the RERE extension in Paris, uh, which I need to check on because I don't know if it is actually going to open next year. Um, this is an eight kilometer tunnel and I want to, so we have a data phase, um, but I'm actually going to not use our internal data viz and show it on Google Earth. Not because you shouldn't use our data viz, you should use our data viz, um, but rather because on Google Earth it's easier for me to play around with uh, seeing what's out there and and, and, uh, and, and moving around and, uh, and showing various crayons that, that, that it's connected. So the whole point is that um, the RERE uh, I don't think I have a good map on Google Earth of just the RER without crayon. Um, so the RERE uh, is essentially they took the um, network that hit Gare de l'Est, which is this train station. It looks like it's going north, but you can see it immediately turns north. It turns north west east. Um, so these are the lines that are Concilien P, and the inner ones have been turned uh, into the RERE, and right now it's stubborn, not to go to that. They built a little bit of a tunnel to get to uh, what they call Osman Salazar, which is in the central business district, uh, in lieu of Gaudelet, which isn't. Um, but now they're extending this to the west for something like the running. The operating paradigm they're doing is kind of weird. Um, and uh, so the idea is to go from Osman, from Osman Salazar to La, so, so the idea is to go to La Défense, and when you go to La Défense, you're relieving the RERA. The RERA is, the, uh, is this line. The one goes to Aubert and then Châtelet-Laval, and then goes also east-west, but somewhat farther southeast than the RERA. Well, they do. Some, two of those branches meet there. Um, and... Um, it's about it's eight kilometers of subway. They're surfacing around here. Um, so this is called Nanterre Prefecture um, on the RER. And they're not going to hit that. They're going to build a different station nearby called Nanterre La Folie. Uh, but they are going to hit La Défense. They have to. It's the most important business district outside the center of Paris. Now, um, so the point is that this is really difficult because look at where the tunnels are being built. They're being built through the center of Paris. Um, all of this is the central business district. Um, so historically, city center was here, but it kept creeping west of so the maximum job density is at this point around here, and destinations keep creeping west. Um, so for example, this is Champs-Élysées. This is the Arc de Triomphe. Um, so the destinations keep creeping in this direction. Um, and so uh, this is a very constrained area as a result. And yeah, maybe there's a little bit of a lull here when you're only in Neuilly. Only in Neuilly. It's still a very dense, a very wealthy suburb. Um, and then you're hitting La Défense. So you're hitting a high-rise central business district that was not built um, around the idea that there would be a second RER tunnel. So they built the business district kind of at the same time as the RERA, so that was fine. And they even, at the time, and they even were indecisive about RER versus metro. So they left some space that I think is partly used and partly unused for the, for what became the metro line one. That's 
but um, the RERU was off part of it, so retrofitting it is a challenge, but they're still going to do it. Um, and because it's, uh, and because we, so, so they're doing the most difficult part. And even though there aren't a lot of stations in, the, in this eight kilometer stretch, they're only going to build two, which are uh, Neuilly Port Mayo for the connection to the Metro and also to the RERC and uh, La Defense. But these are very deep stations, very large digs. Um, so, so again, very complex. And, and the point is that if you build it as full metro, um, you would also be building metro into the suburbs. So you would have longer overall length, higher overall costs, but lower costs per kilometer. Because when you build the easy parts as well, your costs rise, but your unit costs fall. And the whole point of regional rail is that you reuse legacy track for, for such things. So outside the city or, or outside, maybe it doesn't have to be just, you know, but outside the city zone, you won't really want to use existing suburban tracks. And so these uh, um, tracks work to, again, reduce overall growth. It is prudent to build regional rail. It is advisable to build regional rail. It is good to build regional rail. Um, but because you're only building the most difficult part, um, it means that your unit cost, so the cost per kilometer, will look larger. Um, corner, good question. Um, I am not 100% certain. I believe the answer is yes. Um, it is difficult for me to say this with um, with any certainty, and the reason is that Japan has been in full austerity mode in the last 20 to 30 years, and as a result, there aren't that many recent examples. Um, but I have noticed that um, in Japan, they build very little. Uh, they require a 30-year payback. So 3.3% financial rate of return, which is well above the actual rate of return of the Japanese economy. Um, I think it's maybe 1.5% is what the private sector that people believe is quasi-state will loan to. So JR Central, I believe, is paying about a, about 1% or 1.5% um, on the Chuo Shinkansen loans and that there's a private corporation, although it's a private corporation that is to some extent an arm of the Japanese state. Um, so no, nobody believes that Japan will ever let any of the mega core, uh, many of the cor any of the mega corporations go bankrupt. But this is especially true of JR Central because it's the, the Shinkansen kind of Japan's pride and uh, the former chair um, Ka um, Kasai is very politically connected. Um, so that's 1.5 percent, and this, and subways aren't any less an extension of the state than the high-speed train, and so the uh, and and so they should be building at a rate of return of, of maybe 1.5 percent financial. Uh, yeah, Jefferson is also loaded, but I mean I mean it's loaded relative to normal things, not loaded relative to how many trillions of yen it's going to. Cost to build a true washing concept, but and and with so, but I mean with Tokyo Metro, the problem is that um, they're trying to reduce capital costs in order to uh, make it look good for privatization. So um, instead of deferring maintenance, they just don't build enough infrastructure, so they kind of create a shortage. And um, but anyway, the point is that um, there aren't that many examples in Japan, but the examples that there are kind of show high per kilometer cost, but you can also see where they're being built, and it's all really difficult things. So I'm actually going to see, so let's actually see if I can find the fullest of the... So um, the Tsukuba Express is a nice example of something that's unusually um, a line, I, I don't remember if, we, no, we tagged it as not regional rail, and the reason we tagged it that way is that this entire thing um, is new build. Um, from uh, from Akiba to to Tsukuba, and this is a don't get me wrong, this is not a cheap line, but it's um 
in today's money, uh, in today's money, it's probably it's going to be more than it's probably going to be 160, 170, and this is 28 percent well. So kind of expensive, but not. I mean, I mean, but it's not the Anglosphere. It's maybe the higher end of Germany, and um, and and if you look at the, and, and the really annoying things that there are in Tokyo. Um, so for example, the Fukushima line was not especially expensive at all. Um, this is 208, but this is in dollars of 16 year, or 17 years ago, so it's actually more. So it's actually more like 300, which is not bad. Um, Minato Mirai is incredibly expensive, um, but Minato Mirai is also in downtown Yokohama, so it's a very short line where they just connect it, where they they just um, I think extended uh, one of the Tokyo lines into downtown Yokohama in tunnel. So it's again, so it's only the most so it's only the most difficult parts, even if it and and this is why it's also tagged as regional rail. Um, why is it so high that? Because in absolutely the defined function. Um, Tokyo then, uh, the, um, this, um, is all elevated, and again, the dollars of 10 years ago, it's more like 120 ish today, um, which is a really complex L, by the way, it's, a, it's an L over L. Um, so Tokyo construction costs are, you can kind of see where they're high, but it's, but, but it's actually likely that, yeah, they're doing it because it's, they're building the difficult parts, and the parts that, I mean, I tag these as regional rail, the South Pacific, um, extension, but it's kind of unfair. Um, it's all the so these guys are the cheaper line is the longer one. So this is 300 ish million per kilometer in fairly recent dollars, not all but almost all underground. Um, so it's just that, yeah, Japan probably only builds the most expensive parts. Because the cheaper parts maybe are not in my in our subway database. Um, I mean, they, they they are also expanding their suburban lines. Just that I don't happen to have neat costs for the cost of grade separations or the cost of um, converting a two-track mainline to a four-track mainline. Which I'm forgetting which of the privates in Japan. I don't mean just in Japan. Which of the privates in Tokyo recently did that? Um, but because we're looking at tunnels, yeah, for things that are very S-bahn type. It kind of misses the surface improvements. We do try to include them where we have the numbers. Um, I think I think uh, Alex included the surface improvements for um, for Mamurai, but also as a separate item, the uh, tunnels for Mamurai. So this is kind of the regional rail factor. So again, a regional rail looks like it. So it's one of those things that it's useful to understand for the database. Um, Sometimes it's worthwhile imitating the expensive lines because the expensive lines are expensive per kilometer and not per project, if it makes sense. So you definitely do want to build regional rail, even though it's more expensive, because again, it's not actually more expensive. It's more expensive per kilometer, but you will build less tunnel than you will need to if you... I won't say if you follow, if you follow China. I mean, China also has much less of a legacy rail network to leverage. It's just that what it has, it doesn't use very efficiently. Uh, through running subways are, I mean, I feel weird about calling them regional rail, to be honest. Something, I mean, the Fukutoshi line especially, um, so the Oedo line can't possibly be regional rail. The Fukutoshi line is in the sense of being a connection between, uh, what is it? It's connecting Toyoko, the, um, Toyoko, right, to the south, and to the north, it's Tobe Kibokura. But um, but it's also a rather long tunnel through it's through an area that's very central, but is not central Tokyo. It's not the main CBD. Um, the the Ikebukuro Shinjuku Shibuya area. I mean, there's lots of stuff there, lots of jobs. But I mean, the network you can kind of see just on the Google Earth layer, just because, but just by um, line density, that this is a central business sector, and the Fukutoshi line is this. Um, and the very close to the parallel thing is the Yamanoto, so it's above ground. Um, so it's... 
I mean, it's a judgment call, but it's but I don't feel comfortable calling that regional rank. Um, maybe it's a, maybe it's biased. I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's biasing my data actually. It's because this line is so close to the global median that decisions about this line specifically shouldn't matter very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the fact that Minato Mirai, I, I mean, I think we did call Minato Mirai um, regional rail because it's construction just in the central, just in the center of Yokohama. I'm not sure if it's, is it this line? Yeah. So you can kind of see, this is, the, this is the CBD at the waterfront, so, um, so, yeah, so, so, if the, so if they didn't think of regional rail, if they felt like China, they would probably build a line like this, but it would be an entirely new metro line with a long tail in the suburbs with lower construction costs per kilometer. Um, so, this is, so this is the regional rail. I, I, I want to emphasize this just because it's something that looks expensive, but is actually the right choice um, where it's available. Now, the other thing is um, I, I'm focusing on institutions and not on, for example, engineering. And the reason is, so, or rather, I view engineering decisions it's really important, but it's something that kind of follows institutions. So, for example, in the United States, um, they don't care about cost minimization, so the engineering techniques are not geared toward that. And because this has been this like like this for generations, the engineers it's not like the engineers know of a good way of doing value engineering and or, and cannot do so. In many cases, they do not know how to value engineer. It's really bad. Um, but I, I want to kind of focus on the high speed rail cost because that is not something that should depend too much on the soil. I mean, if there's heavy tunneling, then sure, but a lot of these lines don't have heavy tunneling. Um, but you might also notice that the tunneling proportion depends heavily on where you're building. So France has practically no tunneling. Belgium has little tunneling. Um, I forgot whether Turkey learned how to build high speed rail from France. I think it did. I'm not sure. Um, Morocco um, learned how to build high-speed rails from France. The, in the entire Maghreb keeps buying turnkey French systems, um, and, uh, and and they actually work quite well. So the, these are so this is by far the cheapest line. I mean, okay, not by far because of the success, but um, but, but that is the 200 kilometer line. Um, so this is by far the cheapest. 300 plus line in the database. Um, that is recent, so not something like the uh, JFSC does. Um, and and so this is so when you build kind of the front row, you don't have a lot of tunneling. Um, and um, Spain is in a more difficult environment, and the Basque and, and the Basque Y is especially tunnel heavy, but the other ones aren't especially tunnel y. Um, Madrid Barcelona is eight percent, for example. And then you have Germany. Germany has mountains, but this is not why the lines are thirty percent in tunnel. The lines are thirty percent in tunnel because the local engineering decision is to build the lines with very shallow grades because they want to be freight friendly. So the grades are normally not all of these lines, um, but the ones where the grades are steeper. Are, or like this because it's so mountain, it's because the terrain is so bad, they have to have tunnels anyway, like uh, Crown Frankfurt. Um, and even then, Crown Frankfurt is the least tunnel thing uh, in Germany. And so, um, so because they have trade friendly grades, 1.25%, not 3.5 or 4%, um, the tunnels um, are a lot more extensive and this cascades to higher costs, even as when you net out the tunnels, I don't think there's any German premium for France. It's just that there's a German premium in just building gratuitous tunnels. Um, part of it is NIMBYism. Um, so, so in Germany, there's a lot of NIMBYism and a culture of lawsuits um, and adversarial legalism, much like in the United States. I mean, I think it still works a lot better here than the United States. Other things here are done well, but um, our costs are medium, not low. So something has to be done, not perfectly, and, and that is it. And so um, it's useful to, to, to understand that um, there's actually a fair amount of correlation between high-speed rail and 
urban subway goes. It's not perfect. Uh, Asia tends to be just worse at high-speed road construction. So Asia is really good at operation. The Shinkansen especially is better rolling stock than European high-speed European high-speed trains. But construction here in Euroland is cheaper than in Asia, and the reason is the aerial bit. Um, so we see how aerial heavy Asian things are. And this is the highest, I think, in Europe. Oh, in Bordeaux Toulouse, which is me counting because there was no better way. Um, but, but you can see, I mean, 10% or, or I guess 11% aerial is considered high here, and usually something like 3% of the tracks are laid on the ground. Um, there's cut and fill. They try to balance cut with fill in order to minimize costs. Um, tunnels exist where necessary, but um, but it's not that common for a line to be predominantly down. Um, now, unless it's uh, unless it's specifically a, some kind of mountain crossing, like um, Florence to Bologna. Uh, it's not a base tunnel, by the way, but it is ninety four percent tunnel, so close to it. Um, but Italy, for example, has more viaducts. Italy is kind of an exception to a little bit. Um, like Asia, it's not, not that they've learned from Asia or anything, they learned from France, but they uh, overbuilt in Italy. And because of the overbuilding, they have more massive structures. Because they have more massive structures, they have higher costs. Um, and this is not something that is reflected in Italian subway costs, which are not so overbuilt. In fact, they're in many ways underbuilt. They have tiny stations providing equivalent capacity through incredibly high frequency things for driverless ops on the newer lines in smaller cities like Turin, Russia. But um, it's really the uh, overbuild. Um, but in general, I mean, the, I think it, it's not a coincidence that the worst builders of high-speed trains, which are Britain and the Netherlands, also have approximately the highest costs in Europe um, for subways. So some of it is also so some of this is institutional. Hey, Huli. Um, you uh, Hulu, so um, you missed where we were um, secretly plotting to uh, um, carpet nuke uh, Köln. We begin bombing in five minutes. Um, so at any rate, um, the so the issue here with costs is, I think it matters that costs are mostly a feature of the country. It's also true for and for high rail with a certain amount of correlation, not a perfect one. But we can see kind of a cheap francosphere. We can kind of see French costs exploding at the same time for high-speed rail, which would be um, not Lyon Turin, but Bordeaux Toulouse and Nîmes Montpellier. Uh, so Bordeaux Toulouse, I mean, yes, it's not dollars, it's not euros of the same year, or dollars of the same year, but we're still talking about something like a fifty percent premium over the older lines, and this is a line that has very little tunneling. It's not like all because it's slightly tunnelier than the previous line. And um, especially compared to the, sorry, especially compared to the GVS, for example, uh, it's not quite 2x because 2021, 20, 2008, but still, it's something like 1.6x um, on a line that's more viaducty but slightly less tunnelly. Um, and so the situation is that, um, in the, so it matters, I think, that French construction costs are exploding for high-speed rail, and I don't know to what extent it's reflected in this table, but Compagnie Express is seeing constant cost overruns. Um, they're kind of anglicizing their construction, unfortunately, in France. Um, don't worry, Guli, there is a... Um, there's also a secret test of uh, ABM missiles stationed in cut. Stationed in cut. Um, so at any rate, um, I bring this up because costs are a feature of the country. Um, the rather interesting thing is I don't know to what extent this stable will reflect. Um, is that costs tend to stack. So I don't have a full cost account for Taiwan because um, 
I know how much it costs to build the initial MRT system in Taipei, but I'm not certain what the length of that test it was because um, the because it just said the original system cost this amount to build, and there is a little bit of uncertainty over um, not not uncertainty to, to Taiwan, but just I am not certain what um which projects count as part of the original system or not. So there's a little bit of a leeway. But my understanding is the high Taiwanese costs. Um, so in today's money for not for zero percent, sorry, for the first zero percent around for hundred percent underground. Um, the, um, so the Taoyuan is um thing they're doing is about four hundred million dollars per kilometer, US dollars. And I think this is actually pretty common in Taipei for um for lines that are. Okay, so I don't think I have the historic lines in Taipei in this part of the table. Yeah, so system to 2012 at this is the best I could do. It's also about 400. And I tried to make the um, these things mutually uh, mutually exclusive. I may have some overlaps, but I don't think I do. Nehu looks cheaper, but Nehu is strongly elevated. Um, also drives her last, I believe. And I believe, I mean, I, I wrote it and it was right Um, And so the point is that high Taiwanese costs stick. Um, and why do I focus on Taiwan? I focus on Taiwan because I was told um, an institutional explanation for why Taiwanese costs are high. Um, my understanding is that it's kind of well believed or widely believed in Taiwan. I have no idea if it's true. Things are often widely believed while being false. But what I was told is that um, it's an artifact of Taiwan's of, of the timing of Taiwan's transition to democracy. So Taiwan and South Korea, these are my main two comparisons of this. South Korea has persistently low cost, Taiwan persistently high ones. Not for speed of price, but real. South Korea is cheaper than Taiwan, but it's not cheap. But um, for subway tunnels and for the, even the underground parts of, uh, of Korea and high-speed rail, Korea is very cheap. And the thing is that Korea and Taiwan are economically very similar. So, I mean, not the exact same industry. So, for example, Korea is more heavy industry and Taiwan is more um, electronics and, and chips. Um, or uh, Taiwan isn't as dominated by chipboard um, as Korea. Um, and so, the um, but 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 in the sense that they're both newly industrialized countries that um, develop around the same time, both kind of looking up to Japan, having similar models, also both having uh, right wing autocracies that were supported on anti communist grounds, and they both dem uh, and exploited local divisions that are not very well known in the West. In the West, everyone thinks that East Asia is homogeneous. Um, South Korea and Taiwan are not homogeneous. They have deep identity cleaves that um, are not considered important in the West. So in South Korea, it's um, it's between provinces. So South Korea historically has eight provinces: three and a half are in the north, five and a half are in the south, uh, five and a half are in the south. Um, the two southernmost ones; these are they, they will all look like single provinces because they've been split, but they're historically culturally single provinces. There's Gyeongsang, which is this, Busan and Daegu. And uh, Jala, which is Gongju, and um, and Mokpo, um, and uh, these provinces kind of hate each other. Um, the right wing autocracy came from Gyeongsang. They steered development there and underdeveloped Jala. Jala became the hotbed of democracy. To this day, Jala votes for the left in in presidential elections by unbelievable margins. We're talking eighty something percent. Um, and, and Gyeongsang is more right wing. Um, and so, um, and like it was in Taiwan, there's a big identity cleave between people with Chinese and Taiwanese identity. So, uh, people, who's, uh, people who came as refugees from the PRC in, in around 1949 are KMT identified. They were kind of viewed as the vanguard for the KMT. Uh, whereas the opposition, is very rude in people with a Taiwanese identity. Generally, people who 
uh, who are Chinese, not um, not indigenous, but who but whose ancestors came to Taiwan well before 1949. And so, the, again, big identity cleaves, extremely contentious politics. Um, they get on parliament fights in Taiwan. They uh, they, they they do things like spill blood on and doing spill blood in the metaphorical sense of kill each other. I mean, in the literal sense of I think showing up with like pig's blood or something and spraying it to make a point that the other party is doing whatever. And so um, again, again, very politically cleaved countries. Uh, and uh, and the transition to democracy are at the same time, so 80s to 90s. Uh, and on uh, and I believe the watershed. What the fuck is what? I think it was big blood. So let me actually check this. So there's this hilarious blog called Parliament Fights. Oh, it's pig guts. So um, there's this blog called Parliament Fights about people um, getting into physical fights in uh, Parliament. Um, and Taiwan keeps starring in this because these people uh, hate you. Oh, okay, this is Czechia. Um, okay, this is Ghana. This is the DRC. Tunisia, oh, and Taiwan, yeah. So, um, so the thing is that Taiwan is has two parties, each of which thinks the other is not fully legitimate. Uh, as the representative of the Taiwanese people slash of the Republic of China, depending on which party you support. And um, so the, the, they make their points in, in very stark ways there. Uh, imagine the Knesset were run by uh, people who are slightly less venally emphasized slightly. Um, and speaking of venality, the point is that the point I'm making is that Korea and Taiwan transitioned to democracy around the same time. And in both cases, it was in stages. So mass protests, um, regime fires on protesters. Eventually, regime stops firing on protesters and permits political pluralism. Um, but it takes a while for the left-wing opposition to win elections. I believe in Taiwan, it's 96. In Korea, it was 97. Um, and... Um, so, so during the, so the point is that in Taipei, they built the MRT during this transition to democracy. So something very important in a democracy is the distinction between the party and the state. Okay? So um, despite what um, people at um, Konrad, uh, at Konrad Adenauer House might, might believe, um, the uh, CDU is distinct from the German state. That said, even um, people from from Konrad Adenauer recognize that, to it, to, that there is at least some kind of distinction between CDU slash CSU, the party, and the German state. And they have separate budgets, and you don't randomly use um, federal use the federal budget to pay for party things. Um, in, a, in an authoritarian country where there's a one-party system, the party is the state. So this distinction does not exist. Is there in Bavaria? Um, my understanding is that Sveda is still a lot less corrupt than possibly even the KMT today, let alone the KMT of 30 years ago. Um, so the point is that during the transition of democracy, only they needed to separate state funds from party funds, and um, this meant that they needed to park party funds somewhere because they didn't want them to accidentally turn into state funds that the opposition could use, and they got parked in really expensive infrastructure. And in South Korea, the reason it didn't happen is that um, even though in general these are similar countries, South Korea is bigger, 
um, and maybe even more capital centric than Taiwan. And Taiwan is already one of the most capital centric cities in the world, um, countries in the world. And so, um, the, uh, so the upshot is that Seoul actually built a subway system starting in the 70s because it needed to even then. And so there was already rapid expansion in the 80s. Um, it kind of created a blueprint for uh, uh, cost-effective expansion. And I should also add something really important. South Korean wage jobs have risen significantly. Um, so, so there's World Bank. Okay, yeah, it's GDP per capita. So let's do U.S. as a benchmark. And Korea. Um, so the United States has had economic growth in the last 30 years. All of this is in the same year's dollars, by the way. So it's just from 2020. So the United States is something like 50% richer on the eve of Corona. At this point, it's recovered from maybe even a little more than 50% than it was in 1990. In Korea, 43, 13. So Korea is more than three times as rich right now as it was in 1990. Um, and um, so as, as your country grows, it will need a subway. Um, and if your country is richer somehow, it'll need a subway earlier. If it's bigger, it'll need a subway earlier. Now, so, so it started building in, so, so it started building in the 70s, it had already kind of an expansion wave in the 80s. And so at the time, they didn't need to do this weird thing about parking funding. I also, also think that um, there were not so much as a, of a party state in Korea. They were, I think they were run as a no party system, so a military government in, in the 70s and early 80s. But regardless, um, the corrupt, I mean, the kind of transition from that kind of corruption to a different kind of corruption happened later. So the subway was already used to doing things right. Um, and even though we and look at how much richer Korea is, this has not just been the capitalists getting richer at the expense of the workers in the country. Wages have been rising um, because eventually they, they uh, so so they uh, industrialized the entire country and then they ran out of thousands and then the workers started demanding wage increases. They, these were um, an important part of the protests that led to the transition to democracy. The, uh, Early growth involved wage suppression, so increases in productivity without increases in wages in order to export better. And then in the 80s, they said, wait a minute, there's money now. We're not as poor as we were 20 or 30 years ago. Why isn't any of the money going to workers? So wages have risen sharply since this era. And it's not in our table because in our table, um, we're not doing inflation adjustments yet, only PFP adjustments. So... The historic data that we have, which um, isn't as perfectly integrated, we have historic data for Korea. The construction costs in Korea are not higher, barely higher now than they were in uh, the 1980s. Despite fast economic growth, economic growth has again involved strikes and things going and surplus going to workers, not just to owners. And so, even with this, the habits of good and cost of construction were set up in Korea. And in Taiwan, they weren't. In Taiwan, um, because at the time that the standards might have been set, they had this kind of corruption in the transition to democracy. Um, construction costs in Taiwan today remain very high. At this point, yeah, I, I mean, the KMT and, uh, and DPP have, been, have huge, identity polit um, huge identity politics fights. Again, physical fights as well. But there's no um, identification of the party by the country. Yeah, and in general, this is something that what you're describing is something that's pretty common as a, in a transition country. We don't think of South Korea and Taiwan as transition countries because they transitioned politically, but not economically. They were never socialist. But it's useful to think of it politically as transition, yes. Um, Now, so the point that I'm making with this is that Taiwanese costs are persistently high. Once the bad, once the bad habits set in, they continue even when... I don't think that at this point the corruption levels in Taiwan are unusually high. 
Um, the I, I mean, I haven't been, I, I, it's not like I read Taiwan Eastern very closely. I read it decently well, especially when it comes to Corona this way. I mean, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I preface basically every news story about Taiwan with meanwhile in the first world. Let's, let's see how much Corona they have today. I don't think I've checked today. I think I last checked yesterday. Oh shit, they even have Delta, and this is even, remember, in, in so, so not that Delta managed to jump their um, quarantine protocols because we know that Delta, um, because we know that um, Delta, I, I guess it's, it already existed at the time Taiwan locked down hard, but... Um, Okay, so let's look for a moment at the number of cases in Taiwan. Um, this is a country where I think 5% of the population is vaccinated. They have a lower corona infection rate uh, over there than uh, they have, I, I believe, anywhere in Europe, certainly in Germany. In Germany, um, don't be wrong. And, and so in Germany, I think scale the population of Taiwan are around here, about 10 per Capita per million people per, year, per day. And these unvaccinated bastards, because they're actually good at running public health, were here. They're here. They didn't have corona for about a year. Um, and, uh, and then people got complaints and, with, with entry and they had the variants. But the point is that I do sometimes follow Taiwanese news and a country with the corruption levels in general that would be that were that were actually present in the case of KMT infrastructure in the 1990s wouldn't look like this. It would look like and then run out of the screen. No, not again. They, Taiwan never locked down in the first wave. Taiwan. Um, I think it maybe did local social distancing, but um, but but I think at the peak, first of all, um, maybe the trough is better. Um, at, at the trough, I think that uh, ridership on the Taipei MRT was maybe twenty percent down, and then it was back and jumped back from something like only nine percent down. And the um, and pe people just wore masks, and they have mandatory centralized quarantine, and um, and pre-variants, this killed at the, between the middle of April and the middle, so the middle of April 2020 and the middle of May 2021, they had one outbreak. It had 15 people in January. They put 4,000 people in quarantine, and this is why they had 15 and not more people getting. Um, so no, they don't rely on lockdown. I mean, they're doing it now because alpha is, I think, 40% more virulent than the base corona, and Delta is 40% more um, virulent than that. More, more infectious, I mean, I, no. I mean, Delta I think is also more virulent, but um, but infectivity is what matters. Um, so now they're starting to introduce lockdowns, but again, we're talking about a country that organically went down from here to here. And in the summer, we in Euroland, I think we averaged around here. Germany, I think Germany in June 2020 was around here per capita. So Taiwan is getting to where Germany peaked and or, or bottomed. And I imagine Taiwan will keep going down. I do know this. But my point is that Taiwan, again, it's a country that I do sometimes follow you know, in mass media just because I want to see what how they're dealing with corona. Um, my, my initial test case was to see how their public transit was dealing with, which was very well. Thank you very much. Um, complaining that uh, they needed a bailout because they were profitable and suddenly in 2020 they stopped being profitable. And I imagine by 2022 they're going to be back to being profitable. Um, but, the, but unfortunately, even though the operations in Taiwan are very good, the capital exp expansion remains very expensive because, again, they got bad habits. Again, it's not because Taiwan is generally an incompetent country. Again, we're about 50% first dose. 20 something percent both deltas. It's 
6.4, I mean, you multiply it by 10 sevenths. So this is uh, 9 in a million every day. A little more than half the population has gotten at least one dose. Um, more than a third has been fully vaxxed. Um, but Taiwanese standards were here. Taiwan is 5% vaccinated. This is non pharmaceutical interventions. So, my point so, in infrastructure, again, they kind of suck in construction. Um, and they actually cause damage to other countries in their suckitude in construction because uh, Japan learned all. And it's not their fault. Um, I mean, it is a little bit their fault. The infrastructure construction for the high speed train was generally bad. But um, this caused. <coughs> It caused global damage in the sense that um, Japan drew all the wrong lessons from this. Instead of saying, stop overbuilding viaducts, it doesn't matter what PB consultants tell you. The, what they learned is uh, we must have a turnkey Shinkansen because it feels like shotness when you have Shinkansen trains on European viaducts, even though that works fine. Um, so they kind of paid it forward by screwing over India, by demanding Turkey, and then screwing over taxes and demanding Turkey at much higher costs. Um, so please, um, as I conclude this, please take care of your construction costs. It's okay to say no to things. Remember, you don't want to lock in bad habits. Um, you want to be in a position where you can say no to things and then get something good 10 years later. Um, this is what Zurich did when he said no to the U-Bahn twice and then got the S-Bahn. So, um, so, so this is kind of like the importance of the construction cost story, at least for us at, the, at that like highest institutional level. Um, are there any questions? going to be a short stream today, so I'm going to just take questions and call tonight. And by call tonight, I mean I have a meeting in two hours. I mean, as, as usual, I, I, I like waiting two minutes maybe for how is German feedback to my work? Um, okay, so these are two really good questions. I'm going to answer chronologically. So German feedback on my work, I can't tell. Um, um, my understanding is that people here don't care very much um, because of the Berlin cost control problem. So, it, so the kind of zeitgeist within Europe about construction cost is, I'm going to call it neoliberal, but I'm going to use the word neoliberal in the more standard leftist sense from maybe 10 years ago, rather than uh, in the r slash neoliberal sense, which is really a synthesis of Cold War liberalism with neoliberalism. Um, I, I kind of talk about it as like thesis, which is developmentalism slash Cold War liberalism, which was very much big projects, big, um, big government. I mean, not necessarily high spending, um, but very obtrusive government, and then um, the reaction to failure to certain failures. Um, so, for example, that would be the Jacobian reaction to uh, um, to um, to the failure of urban renewal, leading to communitarianism. But um, often the failure became, uh, but often the failure led to the reaction of neoliberalism, um, especially in Latin America, that kind of turned into. Um, Dogma and development economics, and state capacity is kind of the synthesis. So thesis, developmentalism, slash core liberalism, and um, antithesis, 
neoliberalism, state capacity as a synthesis. So the um, neoliberal zeitgeist is that the government shouldn't be doing big things because they will suck. So this is the kind of Ben Fluthier mentality. And I'm going to actually type um, Fluthier's name because, um, first of all, I'm mispronouncing his name grossly because I'm actually pronouncing most of the letters and this is not how you're supposed to pronounce Danish. Um, Danish, you're supposed to pronounce as few of the letters as you possibly can. Um, but, but I believe that if you, I, I mean, I guess in Swedish, maybe if you, uh, if you do, if you, if you, if you were to pronounce it in Swedish, which is the opposite of Danish, they overpronounce the letters, it'd be Fluf Pieri. Um, so the G would actually be pronounced Fluf Pieri. Um, there's like Greta, kind of like Greta Tudberi. But anyway, um, so that's kind of the mentality that focus on cost overruns, about strategic misrepresentation, about why big things that the government does suck and you probably shouldn't do them. And this is kind of leading to, so in the United States, um, people have actually read Fuse Bear. Oh, the Fuse Love controversy? Yes. So is that where um, there's controversy over whether cost overruns are real, where Fuse Bear says yes because he measures from when the decision is made to the final cost and other people measure from when construction starts to when things uh, open because Fluthberg cares about institutional questions about strategic misrepresentation. So it, so to Fluthberg, um, the point of no return is when there's a big political commitment. Um, so for example, for California, that would be when proposition um, 1A passed in 2008, as soon as that passed, uh, not building high-speed rail would incur a giant psychological and political cost because it would mean saying no to something that the voters had said yes to. It would mean canceling something the voters wanted. Um, and it would also mean openly admitting failure. Whereas if, for example, the line, uh, had, uh, if the system had not been voted on until well into advanced design, then they would have known the cost. Um, and kind of the American reaction, I think also the European one, is that this is purely a matter of estimation. So what they think is that they should just tell people in advance that the costs are going to be high. Um, and I think it's incorrect, actually. I think that um, um, a lot of issues of early commitment are not just... So, for example, in the Netherlands, they have a big early commitment problem, like with Prop 1A in California. They make a decision before the project is fully designed. Um, the problem is not that it's going to lead to optimism bias or to people lying to the public. It's going to lead to surplus extraction. So decision is made. Now it's time for design. And now all of the local actors say, build me a bike path. I want a bike path. Um, or they say, I decided that construction is too noisy. And if you try to explain to me that it's not, I will uh, tell you that you don't understand our local context and where you as an engineer to tell me uh, what my neighborhood is like. So build me a noise wall or only do construction during the daytime. Um, they have all these negatives, uh, all these negative sum games that exist when it's really hard to say no to people. So my view, which is again not neoliberalism but state capacity, is that um, the problem is not cost overruns. I mean, cost overruns are an important problem as a matter of trust, but have high absolute costs. And um, the sort of mechanisms that, and kind of like the honest cost. So in Fluvier or in, um, or maybe even in Vive. The honest cost is the final cost. Um, and really the sin was not telling people in advance what the final cost would be or not knowing what the final cost would be. Um, and in my view, the honest cost is the early cost and the sin is in letting costs grow where they should have been able to tell people, no, you don't get a noise wall. No, we will build 24 seven. Yes, it means that, yes, it means we're tunneling under your property. This means that for one night, you will have noise, and afterward, the TBM is going to be somewhere else. Deal. Um, and um, instead, uh, uh, so so for me, the so so again, so because I think about absolute costs and how to reduce them, rather than how to kind of work backward from an inflated final cost. Um, so I think in very different terms of the literature, and the literature is again politically, I think of it as a as kind of privatize, contract out the state type neoliberalism, the kind of like, like the way that EPP and the more right-wing RE parties think, 
so FTP, VV, D, things like that. Um, maybe even, let's say, the Nordic Center parties. Um, and uh, so, the, so, for example, the um, European Red Perpetration Managers Party thing is the same um, constellation of things um, that I identify with this kind of neoliberal reaction to genuine failures of Cold War liberalism and of developed analysis. Um, so, that, so in Germany, so my point is that in Germany, they react to the to certain failures of folks who are urban planning, not by trying to build more efficiently, but by not building subways. So, first of all, the academic literature is about um, cost overruns. Second, the uh, and, and second, they try to do Berlin cost control. That is, don't build subways, build tramways. Um, bear in mind, families don't suck. I mean, I mean, it's not like in the United States where they've gone through several iterations of that. So instead of building subways, they built light rail. Instead of building light rail, they built BRT, but then it went through BRT creep. So it's just buses with paint and barely even have dedicated lanes. Um, and uh, then instead of building expansions, they've built state of good repair. See previous video or, or some of my recent blog posts for how state of good repair is a racket. Um, and in Germany, they haven't gone through that yet, but um, but they're building kind of like sometimes the wrong things because they they're allergic to subways. Um, so that is my uh, um, so, so that sorry that, that is the reception I got here. My reception, the reception I got here is I don't think very warm, which is sad. Um, okay, so which places are more are most transparent requests? Um, the cheap ones, not all of them. I, I don't know how. Transparent Korea is, and my understanding is that Elif had to use non-public data to some extent, or, or make some certain data public in Turkey. I'm not sure, but Italy is actually very transparent. So um, you need to know what link to press. So I mean, it's not. So if you ask me, Alon, give me a breakdown of the construction costs of, let's say, Milan Metro Line Five. Um, I don't think I'll be able to do it. And the reason is that Milan Metro Line 5 is not, it is just a little bit old enough. I don't think it's one of our test cases. I believe our, prices, our test cases are Metro Line 4 in Milan, uh, the B extension in Rome, and the um, ongoing extension in Turin. Uh, and the reason I can't tell you even what lines we're doing is that um, the Italian case is outsourced to Marco. Um, but Marco, for example, would be able to tell you, and these, these are all public. PDFs, these PDFs have a cost breakdown that gives you exactly what you need. This amount for tunnels, uh, if the line is partly it is built in with a mix of methods, they will say this amount for tunnels with cut and cover, this amount for tunnels that are bored, this amount for at grade, this amount for elevated, this amount for stations, this amount for electrical systems, this amount for uh, signals, this amount for the trains. This amount for uh, police security during construction. This amount for general overheads. So th they give you in categories that are very easy. So Italy is actually incredibly transparent. Um, Italy is stereotyped as very corrupt. Italy generally, so Italy has genuine governance problems. I would say the biggest one is that they are, um, uh, is, is they have a lot of tax avoidance. So um, so Italy is too much of a small business country and not enough of a, of a big business country. Um, and, uh, the, and, and the reason is that, uh, so part of it is regulations that make it harder for businesses to grow, but part of it is not even regulations, it's informal. Um, family scale businesses have a lot of tax dodging and so they can't, and this means that they can't grow because if you hire from outside the family, your workers can rat you out. So you will not hire outside the family. It also means that your small businesses are not going to be uh, are not going to be hiring based on merit. They're going to be you're going to hire your nephews and cousins, um, and this is a big drag on the Italian economy. Um, there's a paper by uh, Luigi Tingales about this. So let me actually say uh, Luigi Tingales, Italy stagnation IP. Okay, so this is so uh, this is in Vox EU, which is uh, 
um, which is not papers, but it basically it's good as papers. Um, and so, for example, they're they're talking about the stagnation of Italy. Um, and um, by the way, um, as a euro, I feel obligated to note that um, if you extend a few uh, a few more years, and they think that Germany and France catch up better with the United States, so it's not like there's actual stagnation here and in France since 2005. Um, like we've we've caught up with the Americans, but anyway, but but Italy, but Italy is, and um, the uh, so the problem is uh, it, it's not corruption. It's it's not that people pay bribes. Um, it's tax avoidance, and so um, it's so when it comes to transparency, it's actually pretty good because um, so so this is a rant that I, I think I've delivered elsewhere. Um, when a country is infamous for something, it often is aware of the problem and then gets around to fixing it. Um, so let's see, Germany. Um, what is Germany most infamous for? Um, so selection of... Uh, yeah, this. So uh, this is probably the thing that uh, Germany is most infamous for. Um, so as a result, starting in maybe the starting with the Knifal, uh, and which is I think seventy one or seventy two by uh, Willy Brandt, Germany started actually addressing that and kind of stopped being especially anti-Semitic. At this point, the anti-Semitism here and just mostly people who think that they're helping and aren't. It's, it's kind of, if you're familiar with queer spaces, a lot of it is allies kind of uh, sucking all the oxygen out of the room and making it all about themselves. So that is our problem. But over here, when white supremacists uh, chant anti-Semitic slogans, they actually get suppressed. Um, when we have people in the military who get caught being neo-Nazis, we don't pretend that it's not happening. It's in the news. They, I think they're maybe even disbanding a military unit where they uh, that has too many neo Nazis in it. So, um, so Germany at this point is plausibly the least racist. It, in, in the, so I, I don't. Want to, I mean, it's not the least racist in everything, but in certain things that are related to the sort of Holocaust, it's the least racist part of Europe. Um, and also less than the United States, I think. And not in everything, but. But in things that are related, to, but in things that look like the Holocaust, whether they're against Jews or other people, um, or the United States, very infamous for racism against black people. So in the 1960s, it made a collective decision to stop. And uh, and did the United States stop being racist? Absolutely not. But the extent, first, but first of all, the extent of, for example, the racial wage gap shrank substantially in the middle of the 20th century. And second. Um, the civil rights laws became a template for how to fight racism. Um, so at this point, maybe Europeans keep dismissing the United States as a horrifically racist place because everyone knows about, for example, um, George Floyd, about police brutality, which is still far, far, far worse in the United States in the United States than it is here. But on certain other things, the United States might be as good, or something's even better on matters of, for example, representation. Um, and people in Europe won't learn because they think that the United States is still Jim Crow. So in the same way, so, so in the same way, for a non-racial example, um, in Italy, the same thing is for corruption. Everyone knows about the mafia. Everyone knows about the briberies. Over the bribery, everyone knows that the politicians there go to jail. And here's the thing: the politicians went to jail. Um, the current crop of people, or the people who came in after all the politicians were sent to jail. Um, and yes, one of them is Berlusconi, who was very clearly as corrupt as those people. Um, so, so in the same way that um, the so in the same way that uh, the United States didn't actually stop being racist, and uh, yeah, so in the, same, in, the, in the same way that Germany still has neo Nazis, in the same way that the um, in the in the same way that the United States did not stop being racist in 1968. Um, in the same way that Italy did not stop being racist, did not, I mean, Italy, of course, didn't Italy didn't stop being racist. Italy is probably one of the most racist developed countries. Um, in the same way that Italy didn't stop being corrupt um, with Manipolita, um, 
in uh, and all of these things kind of ended in very dirty ways. Maybe not the maybe not in Germany because, for example, Willy Brandt survived the, the election of Frederick Nifa, but the but it's certainly in the United States, civil rights turned into a, into a huge Nixonian backlash, and in Italy, Mani Polita turned into a, into Berlusconi. Um, and on hindsight, things have gotten a lot better. So Italy is much more transparent right now, um, and it has strong. Um, anti-corruption laws, and, and in fact, I would recommend that other countries learn from uh, Italian anti-corruption laws. Obviously, not everyone. I mean, I don't think Sweden has that much law. Sweden is, by the way, also very transparent. So it's less retrievable in Sweden than it is in Italy. But in Sweden, I can still find um, decently good uh, lists of contracts. Again, the itemization is not as good, at least from what I found so far, as it is in Italy. Uh, but for example, I can find you individual contracts and roughly how much you're expecting to cost. It's all public. It's in, I mean, you need to know where to find it, but it's all but it's all public. Obviously, it's all in Swedish, but I mean, that's not actually that much of a problem when I understand the field. Um, I mean, would I be able to do it in Chinese? No, but in Swedish, sure. Um, and um, and and so in the Nordic countries they're very transparent. In Switzerland they have to be transparent because all government spending has to go to referendum, and they even arranged the exact nature of how the referendums work that they don't commit or that they don't commit too early. Um, the way it works in Switzerland is they finalize the design and then they go to ballot on it. Um, so there's an actual embarrassment factor for uh, not finishing the project or for having big cost overruns. Um, Whereas in the United States, the magic asterisk, high speed rail in California, if you ask me what the original sin was, so part of it is early commitment, but also at the time in 2008, they thought the budget was going to be $33 billion in constant dollars in 2008 prices, which is how it was advertised to the public. But American government budgeting is not ever done in constant dollars, unlike, for example, in this part of the world. So in France, the, the numbers are always in euros of a fixed year. So all of the, for example, Grandparents Express numbers are the euros of 2012. Or in Stockholm, by the way, they've had a cost overrun um, that will be fixed very soon. I mentioned there's going to be a meeting in an hour and a half. Um, so in Sweden, the costs ran over um, by about um, on near Tunnelbahn. So... Okay, so these three projects, these are the extension, so not the next one, which is in all the regional ones. Um, so these are the extensions, uh, these are the extensions of the Stockholm Metro, so not regional rail versus regional rail. Um, platform length is 140. I do not know how long this is, I think 200. Um, these are, uh, these run over. Um, and also, Barcarbu uh, um, is not 3.3, they redesigned to 4.2, to, I think, 4. So these costs are too low. Um, so this sums to 22.4 billion kronor. It actually should be 29 billion kronor in prices, not of uh, 2025, but 2016. So they, they work in constant kronor there. In America, they work in current dollars. Um, so when the referendum said nine billion dollars, it was not nine billion two thousand dollars in two thousand eight prices to be increased based on uh, inflation indicators, but rather it's based on year of expenditure dollars, and these were from the start said to be forty three or forty two, not forty two. So nine out of forty two. So the rest were magic asterisk. So the, there was always the punt. That it was always possible to punt and say, well, there's the recession and the Republicans. I mean, it was all bullshit. I mean, they, uh, I mean, the, at the time they made these plans, this was before the recession. This was before anyone talked of stimulus. At the time that they were talking about this, this was maybe 2006, 2007, when they finalized the language. Um, the American left was still austerian, but still complaining about the Bush tax cuts increasing the deficit. The anti-austerian turn only happened in 2008 when the economy um, collapsed and fiscal stimulus became obviously necessary. Um, so the 
and so they they lucked out to get the federal funding that they that they got, and so they uh, so they, they so they magic asterisk, and then it it was just less transparent. So Switzerland is transparent, Italy is transparent. I think Spain, but I'm not sure. We haven't done a case there. Um, the things I have seen in Spain seem rather transparent. It's just that um, I haven't seen a very neatly itemized list there at all. Again, Sweden is very good. France is decent. Um, the United States is rather bad. The rest of the Anglosphere is, oh my God. Uh, in Australia, they don't even tell you what the what they think the line should cost while they're mulling it. Um, they only communicate things to the public through um, leaks. Um, and, and likewise, in, in Canada, there's very little transparency. Uh, Germany is okay, um, maybe a little worse than France. I mean, I can't... I mean, so I am kind of annoyed that um, they're not announcing the frankfurt Mannheim high-speed rail costs in advance. They're going to announce it at, in Parliament, and then they're going to vote, and the vote is obviously going to be yes, because um, it's, it, it's going to take unusually high costs, like British costs, to get it to be voted down, just because it's, it's an important bottleneck. Um, so anyway, this is um, my question about transparency. Um, yeah, so tomorrow the Fendon Tunnel gets a press presentation. I mean, I hope that the cost of that are going to be the cost of that are going to be okay. Stuttgart 21, for the record, does not have outrageous costs per kilometer. Um, it's had big cost overruns. Um, it's only one station, maybe, but um, or maybe actually no, because of the airport. But I mean, it's not. I mean, it's not many stations or how many um, to, to, to how long the, the track line says. On the other hand, maybe they don't have many stations, but Stuttgart Hauptbahnhof. I mean, it's an eight track station, so, so obviously it's going to be bigger. Um, it's going to be regional rail on steroids, um, even if it's center city. So the so, so I, I hope that um, Frankfurt 21 or whatever they call it um, is conducted successfully. Um, the costs of Stuttgart 21 are 100 percent accessible, uh, or, or not accessible, or 100 percent acceptable in the case of uh, the Frankfurt Fernbahn Tunnel. First of all, it's going to be shorter, as I understand it. Um, so with Trigger 21, they had a lot of ancillary projects that I'm not going to be able to show on Google Earth. So, um, so the project is not just uh, turning this stuff into a tunnel because see, there's um, because they built another. Uh, so so kind of like the main tunnel is from this, which is from Mannheim to. Uh, to not to here, so so they built this uh, Felder tunnel uh, to get to the airport. It's very long, uh, and, and that's kind of connecting into a new high speed line uh, to Ulm. And um, so they also, so they built a lot of ancillary things. It's it's a, I do not know to what extent it's bad scope versus things that were necessary. I will point out um, the so out of these four. Access tunnels, so Feuerbach, so to, um, to anywhere north of Matters, and then Filda, so anywhere south and east of Matters, are expected to have way more trains than uh, these two tunnels. Uh, I think this is Unterturkheim. Uh, no, this is Feldbach. So, so Feldbach and, uh, and Unterturkheim, uh, which is really bad because it means you're forced to either um, interline then suffer from, and then suffer um, on reliability or throw on this, which is good, and this, which is literally a line going back to itself. So again, rather poor design problems that I don't think are going to be a thing in Frankfurt. Um, so, so in Frankfurt, I imagine that what they're going to do is, um, for, for the Fernbahn uh, tunnel, is just to uh, do kind of a, an intercity version of the S-Bahn. So, Probably start tunneling around here, around Frankfurt Ost, and then go to Frankfurt uh, to Frankfurt Hauptbahnhof. So short tunnel, um, maybe just these two stations, and um, because it's not an S bahn, you don't need to have a station at every intersection point with the U bahn. And so it's going to be a simpler project. 
um, much more city center, much more city center. So the usual retail rail cost um, caveat. But again, it, it, it's, it's a cost that may, and, and also Frankfurt is a big city. It's much more central. Um, you definitely want to be in a position where um, you want to be able to throw on trains from points north um, of Frankfurt to points south. Um, so that would be toward Mannheim and Stuttgart and toward, toward the airport, toward Mainz. Um, so again, overall, I think it's a good project. Not at, not at every cost, but it, what I perceive as the current German cost, we'll see tomorrow, it looks good. Yeah, so a good example of this is that uh, is that local pressure can just create scope creep like this, like extra trenching. It's an enormous problem in high speed too. In, in Britain, there's so much gratuitous trenching. Uh, also, especially in the first segment, for the first phase, a lot of gratuitous tunneling because TOFs don't want to see trains essentially. So, so they make up quality of life problems. Um, I find it kind of weird that Godzilla is viewed as an NBA icon, um, just because I think of an NBA as like people people who are actually kind of big, but I mean, small town big, like kind of local petite bourgeoisie or something, um, or, or just randomly aggrieved artillerists um, who don't understand that they're the elite, so they think of them themselves as the oppressed middle classes. Um, again, very big engine checkups. Uh, so I don't think of it as Godzilla because usually I think of Godzilla as something that the NIMBYs call like every tall building. Um, but I mean, the story of Godzilla is I mean, Godzilla was kind of like, it's kind of like their revenge against like atomic weapons. Um, yeah, okay. I'm glad that they're dissolving the SWAT team in Frankfurt. Like, and so, so bear in mind that in the United States, for example, they don't ever do that in the United States. If they've dissolved one police department that was Camden, uh, and they replaced it with county police, uh, which was generally a success. Uh, you know, the new police department was a lot less brutal. Uh, it also made the police department whiter, just because Camden is incredibly poor and also incredibly black. And um, the so, so it was not viewed as a, so it was not viewed as successful police reform while it was happening because the representation got worse. Um, at least to some extent, and um, and, and like general, and, and there's kind of this love of local control on the American left, um, because it means that the ghettos can have their own equivalent of the wooden plant, and the uh, and that kind of like eliminated the wooden plant, um, and had county control of the police, and that turned out to actually be better. Um, it, but it was understood in retrospect as a successful reform. And brought it frequently during the protests in 2020, but they never. But that's Camden. It's it's never done at scale. I mean, I mean, you, I mean, if you do it in New York, you need to. If you do it in New York, for example, you need to have a plan to replace the entire police force. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, in general, I mean, I mean some, a lot of this sympathy comes from the police don't know who they should be shooting, and they accidentally shoot the wrong person. Um, okay, like, I literally just saw this, uh, I, I literally just saw this, uh, where is it? E. This one. Um, no, I don't want to. So, um, this is about an Israeli comedian who's a, uh, about an Israeli comedian who's a, uh, uh, mutual friend on Twitter. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, I'll do it later. Um, about an Israeli comedian who, um, is very dark skinned for an Israeli Jew. Um, she's partly Mizrahi, and uh, at peace protest, at a peace protest, cops assumed she was Arab and started beating her up, and she said, "Stop, stop, I'm Jewish." Um, but uh, the and they stopped. 
So yeah, a lot of the sympathy with police brutality. Um, sorry, not sympathy with the police, sympathy with the victims. It's when police accidentally go after a college student who they thought was less elite than uh, they actually are. Um, anyway, um, I generally thought I was going to finish this at 7.10 or 7.15 and at 7.45. As I said, the hard stop is 9, but um, are there any more questions? I will attempt to not wait until 9. I will attempt to close this in the next few minutes unless people have big questions regarding costs. Please, regarding costs. Um, like, don't ask me about um, police uh, replacement or something, about replacing police departments or something. That's something I, I literally told you all I know about it. As, you, as usual, I mean, I, I mean, if you've seen these videos on YouTube, you know that the last few minutes are always kind of awkward because I give people time because it takes time to type and there's a little bit of lag. I don't know how much lag, I think 20-ish seconds maybe. I mean, I have a way to test this. It will just echo to hell if I try to listen to myself too much. Um, and I would rather not uh, subject people to it just for the sake of my morbid curiosity. Have you looked at costs of mainline projects not involving tunnels? Um, no. And uh, but we're starting. Not or, or, let me amend that. Not systematically. Um, we've started to look at this, and specifically with the case of regional rail, because um, uh, b because so much regional rail American cost badness and Canadian cost badness are things that are not tunnels. So, for example, the Toronto RER is not a tunnel project, um, but you can still measure um, cost gains for infill stations, for electrification. Uh, the problem is that um, for a lot of these projects, um, you can kind of explain too much. It's, it's kind of the um, it's kind of what I joke on Twitter as controlling for discrimination. There is no discrimination against women at work. Um, where um, we, if we try to compute the gender gap or the race gap, you can control for things that are actually discrimination. So, for example, you can control for um, past jobs, but those jobs would have been meted based on the discrimination as well. Or you can maybe uh, look at, or maybe you can uh, look at um, di uh, discrimination by whether one has gone to prison. Um, and it's known, for example, in the United States, uh, if you uh, if you were in prison, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get work um, compared with someone who did not, but has otherwise the same seat, but has the same work experience as you. Um, and uh, and the thing is, the decision whether to imprison someone is racially prejudiced. It is much more likely to uh, um, to be made against a uh, black offender. So you can't control for that because it's controlled for discrimination. So it's the same way. Control. Um, you should not control for scope when it's regional rail. With the subway, you should control for things like number of stations to some extent, st um, capacity. So things like uh, platform length, as we do in the uh, database. You should not control for, however, for things like number of ventilation structures. That's something in New York that we're looking at. Or uh, you should not control for. Uh, whether the stations are mined or cut and cover, because that is a that is an engineering decision for which there's a clear answer. Always, always, always do cut and cover unless you're uh, in extremely hard rock like Stockholm, and then you can um, drill and blast um, and mine. But if you're not that, don't bother. Always top down cut and cover. Um, and uh, so, um, 
with regional rail, this gets worse because with regional rail, it's things like junctions. Um, I don't think that Switzerland has unusually low cost if you control for scope. It's just that Switzerland learned how to minimize scope. Switzerland learned how to build electronics before concrete. Therefore, in Switzerland, um, they've learned how to build the minimal infrastructure necessary. So yes, if you compute the overall cost of something and you can they can write it out, ah, in Switzerland it's cheaper because they didn't build as much double track or they didn't build uh, big grade separations. Well, yeah, because in Switzerland they learned how to integrate the timetable into their infrastructure um, design and as a result they learned how to schedule the trains not to conflict. Um, and, and so um, it is something that I'm interested in. It's, the problem is that essentially you can't do a larger comparison. You have to be at least to some extent case study. And I say to some extent, I mean, the, I mean, there is a danger of pretending every case is unique. It's not. Um, so again, we can look at this. I think it is especially useful if we end up getting a grant to study Northeast High Speed Rail or something. Um, or, or general study comparisons of things that are not subways. Right now, again, all of this is the thing. So am I interested in this? The answer, the answer is yes. Am I paid for this? The answer is unfortunately no. I'm paid for um, um, for subways for now. Um, I will look at this link more closely later. Um, thanks, Rudy. Um, are there other questions? PST ad, adding trucks. Uh, adding trucks in dense areas is annoying, and I've done not infinite, but a decent amount of work trying to figure out how to avoid doing that in Boston, where something that should be four tracks is only three. Um, not in like the Boston area, within the city of Boston, there's this right of way that is very wide, but somehow there's only room for three tracks. Um, so you either widen it with like parking lot takings for four, or you learn how to schedule. Learning how to schedule is cheap. Um, if, the, if nobody has any more questions, I'm going to probably end this in like two minutes. So, like, fast if you. Um, yeah, this looks like an interesting regional rail project. Um, Line walks plus. Oh my god. By the way, all this scope, how much is it even going to cost? We'll find the cost of this later. Oh, thanks. 
Wait, that's from, okay, so two million, two, two billion. It's an old cost now. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching. Um, I do not know whether there's gonna be a stream next week. Um, it depends on whether other things have caught up to me or not. Um, it is likely that the next stream, whether it's in a week or in two weeks, is going to be about um, how New York could build regional rail. So I'm going to go back a little bit to Kramer on Twitter and on Twitter on Twitch, which I did the first couple times, which have not been uploaded because I did not realize I needed to record. Um, so thanks for watching. Um, whether it's here on Twitch right now or later on uh, on the YouTube on the YouTube's. The, inter the U intertubes. And uh, and I will see you probably again. Again, either in a week minus about two hours or in two weeks minus about two hours. Again, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to stream next week. Um, so, ciao, ciao. Thank you.